So today I'm at Fort Custer National Cemetery and I'm standing on the Memorial Path, which I'm gonna feature a lot of the monuments that are here on this path. There's a lot of history here at Fort Custer National Cemetery. And I wanted to share some of that with you today. This is a place that you can't just come in and film without permission. And I did go through about a two week process of getting permission. I also had the help of a very nice man by the name of Floyd Carmichael, who is a member of the Honor Guard serving out here at Fort Custer. And he helped me get an understanding of the place. So I'm gonna to try to share some of that history with you in this video. So come along. To better understand the history of Fort Custer National Cemetery, it's better to start at the origin of national cemeteries in the United States. After the Battle of Gettysburg, which was considered a turning point in the Civil War for the Union, retreating soldiers for the Confederate Army buried their dead in shallow graves on the battlefield. The days that followed the battle, the farmers in the community came forward and approached the government of the United States and said, this is not going to work. We need to actually have an actual cemetery for the fallen soldiers at this battlefield. So 17 acres was set aside as the first national cemetery, which was originally called Soldiers National Cemetery. And President Abraham Lincoln came out for the consecration of that cemetery on November 19th, 1863. The cemetery has since been renamed the Gettysburg National Cemetery. And this is where Abraham Lincoln gave his famous Gettysburg Address. So right near the entrance of Fort Custer National Cemetery, in front of the Visitor Center, there is a historic marker featuring the entire text of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Fort Custer was named after General George Armstrong Custer, a native of Ohio. The original Camp Custer was built in 1917 on 130 parcels of land, mainly small farms leased to the government by the local chamber of commerce as part of the military mobilization for World War I. After a two-year grace period, the Army was allowed to buy it for about $98 an acre. Construction of the camp started in July 1917, and within five months, 2,000 buildings were ready to accommodate 36,000 men. During World War I, some 90,000 troops passed through Camp Custer. In May of 1923, an executive order transferred 675 acres to the Veterans Bureau, which was the predecessor to the organization we know today as the Veterans Administration. And that acreage was set aside for the construction of Battle Creek Veterans Hospital, which was completed in 1924. At one time, the staff and patients from the hospital farmed about 200 acres of the site. It was considered good therapy for patients and helped the hospital to be reasonably self-sufficient. The establishment of Fort Custer Post Cemetery took place on September 18, 1943, with the first interment. Under Army rule, Schools, officers and enlisted men were segregated even after death. So as a result, there's a section A in the old post cemetery section of Fort Custer and there's a section O which was reserved for officers. During World War II, the fort was expanded to over 14,000 acres. In addition to its use as a training base, more than 5,000 German prisoners of war were held there. Finding able farm labor during the war became a problem, so Fort Custer POWs were put to work as an efficient solution to the labor shortage. The last German prisoners were repatriated to their homeland and departed Fort Custer in 1946. As early as the 1960s, local politicians and veterans organizations advocated for the establishment of a national cemetery at Fort Custer. The National Cemeteries Act of 1973, signed by President Richard Nixon, transferred the cemeteries from the Department of the Army to what became the National Cemetery System, NCS, Department of Veterans Affairs, VA. 
In addition, the act directed the VA to develop a plan to provide burial space for all veterans who desired interment in a national cemetery. The Fort Custer site, located midway between Chicago and Detroit, was the VA's choice for the region national cemetery. Toward this goal, Congress created Fort Custer National Cemetery in September 1981. The cemetery received 566 acres from the Fort Custer Military Reservation and 203 acres from the VA Medical Center. On Memorial Day 1982, more than 33 years after the first resolution had been introduced in Congress, impressive ceremonies marked the official opening of the cemetery. There is a special historical marker in front of the Administration Center at the Fort Custer National Cemetery commemorating the dedication ceremony for the cemetery when it opened. And it bears the name of Ronald Reagan, who was president at the time of the dedication. Over the years, many additions and memorials have been added to the Fort Custer National Cemetery. In 1986, the Avenue of Flags Memorial Project was undertaken by the Fort Custer Advisory Committee and dedicated on May 26, 1986. The project was funded by private contributions received from individuals and veteran service organizations. Currently, there are 149 flagpoles on the Avenue of Flags. Originally, there were 152, but three had to be removed when the funeral procession lane were installed. In addition, there are 56 poles behind the stone wall. These are used during the Memorial Day and Veterans Day programs to fly the 50 states and six U.S. territory flags. There is also one lone pole from which the POW MIA flag is also flown. The flag poles and flags are not provided by the cemetery. The Fort Custer National Cemetery Advisory Committee, made up of representatives of veteran service organizations, is is responsible for the poles, maintenance, and flags flown. The funds needed for the flag poles was provided by donations from the public. During the summer months, casket flags are flown. Many of these were donated back to the cemetery by families of the deceased veterans. During the winter months, all weather flags are flown. This prevents icing and weighing down of the flag poles. There is a Visitor's Information Center right near the entrance of the Fort Custer National Cemetery, which includes a gravesite locator where you can look up the name of a deceased that's buried there, and it will not only show you where they are buried in the cemetery, but it will also print you out a map. This information center is quite useful if you're visiting the cemetery for the very first time trying to locate the grave of a loved one. When you come to the end of the Avenue of Flags at the first intersection, to the right, you will find the Memorial Pathway. When you park there and take time to walk the pathway, you'll discover a number of historical markers from all branches of the military, and some commemorate particular events like Pearl Harbor. They also commemorate specific units like the 101st Airborne and the 23rd Infantry Division. There are also plaques commemorating different conflicts like World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, War, honoring those that have fallen and also those that served in those events in history. It's really something that you're going to want to take some time as you walk the path. There are roughly between 20 to 30 different markers to be found there and it is quite a humbling experience and it's well worth the time to study each of the markers and reflect on what they mean. They're put there by various groups and organizations that support veterans throughout the country. Just as a side note, the Memorial Path is not the only trail on the grounds of the cemetery. The 4,700 mile North Country Trail crosses through the northern section of the cemetery. Also along the Memorial Pathway is the Memorial Carillion, which is a set of bells in a tower it rings out chimes 30 times in a row whenever there is a funeral service being held. 
at fort custer national cemetery there are approximately thirty to forty funeral services held in a given week. the carillion that stands at fort custer today was replaced in one eighty five because the original had been struck by lightning and made inoperable. there's a plaque at the base from the american veterans commemorating when the new carillion was dedicated. some of the other structures that you will find at fort custer national cemetery are the committal shelters, which there are two of. These are where funeral services are held. There is also a special pavilion called the Meditation Pavilion, which is in a quiet spot in the woods area. Additionally, there is a columbaria, which is a series of upright wall-type structures used to inter cremated remains for those that wish not to be buried in the ground or prefer the concept of more of a consolidated mausoleum type burial system. There is a very special section of the cemetery that includes the markers as a memorial to the honored veterans whose remains were not able to be recovered or identified or they were buried at sea, their bodies were donated to science or cremated and the ashes were scattered. This section is located in the older part of the cemetery which was originally known as the Fort Custer Post Cemetery. I now want to cover three distinctly different stories about some of the people that are buried here at Fort Custer National Cemetery. In 1986, a handful of Grand Rapids veterans and a veterans auxiliary group were troubled by the burial place of an unknown soldier in a Grand Rapids cemetery that was in an isolated, lonely spot in the cemetery. They sparked a movement to have his grave relocated at Fort Custer National Cemetery. All the information that they had on him was that he had been with the 102nd U.S. Colored Regiment and it was a Civil War infantry. So after a lot of effort, he was brought to Fort Custer National Cemetery with a full ceremony. His pallbearers were from the 102nd United States Colored Infantry Troops Reenactment Group of the Union Civil War unit. They bore his wooden casket to his new grave alongside his fellow Union soldiers. There were about 600 spectators that observed the procession and the ceremony that was held at Fort Custer. Today the grave is still marked unknown 102 U.S. colored with a simple white stone carved with a shield. Not far from the grave of the unknown soldier are the graves of 26 Germans who were prisoners of war during World War II. To better understand the background of their story, we must go back to what Fort Custer's role was during World War II. It was not only just training troops and preparing them to go to Europe. As of about 1943, they began training to receive German prisoners of war. In fact, there are articles in early 1943 that they were training for both Italian and German prisoners of war. And apparently, Fort Custer was designated as a German POW camp. Moving forward in time to 1944, 1945, the German population began to grow and Fort Custer established 19 separate branch camps in the agricultural southern part of Michigan to assist with sugar beets, peaches, and onion planting and harvesting. And towards the end of the war, it was determined that the POW labor was responsible for saving at least 40% of these three main Michigan crops at the time. And there had been a labor shortage because of all the American men overseas serving in the war, the farmers needed to be able to hire a labor force, so Fort Custer made an arrangement to hire out the prisoners of war, and the Germans worked in the fields and orchards through these 19 different branch camps. The money went back to the federal government to cover the cost of their care. At war's end, in the final six months of 1945 alone, 
the German labor force earned money for the federal government at the amount of $1.7 million in the state of Michigan alone. In fact, in March of 1946, when all the prisoners had gone home, the service command unit at Fort Custer were given a very special award and each member of the Custer unit were permitted to wear a golden laurel wreath on their uniform sleeve in recognition of the achievement. Whereas at the same time that was going on, there was about another 2,000 German POWs that were working at Fort Custer in the laundry, shoe shop, salvage yards, and reclamation center that they had set up there, as well as some other mechanical duties that they could be supervised with. Germany surrendered officially on May 7, 1945. The German prisoners of war still remained prisoners of war at Fort Custer through the remainder of 1945 and began being shipped home in December. And the last group of them eventually went home in around March and April of 1946. In November 1945, a work detail of German prisoners was going back to the Blissfield, Michigan branch camp at the end of the day after working in the sugar beet field all day. And the truck driver crossed a railroad track and was hit by a New York Central passenger train. It was a tremendous accident and it resulted in the death of 16 of the prisoners and one of the American servicemen. Eight of the other prisoners were injured in the accident and they were sent back to, to the hospital at Fort Custer and two were sent to Percy Jones Army Hospital, which is now the Federal Center. And so 16 of the German POWs were buried at Fort Custer in the original Camp Custer Cemetery. Fort Custer had to fly in 16 German Republic flags from Pittsburgh because they they didn't have enough to cover all of the caskets. The other 10 remaining German graves that are there are ones that died from natural causes during their time in the prisoner of war camp. So there are 26 gravestones in a line that are all of the German POWs. For years, few if any of the surviving family members of the German POWs ever came to the U.S. to visit the grave sites of their family members until the late 1980s. 80s when a family member came and visited then spearheaded a project to establish a memorial plaque in front of the graves at Fort Custer National Cemetery and they made the dedication to coincide with the National Day of Mourning in Germany. Every year in November there is a special ceremony at the German Memorial held at Fort Custer National Cemetery. When exploring Fort Custer National Cemetery a particular detail to understand in regards to the upright headstone markers is that on the front of the headstone is always the veteran and if their spouse or in some cases their children are buried in the same plot those names are on the back of the headstone now this differs when we get to the flat headstones you'll see either a singular headstone with both the veteran and the spouse on the stone itself or you'll see two stones side by side meaning they share the same plot it all kind of depends on on what the families want and how much text content is actually on the marker of the grave. Which brings us to the final story that I'm choosing to feature to close out this video presentation of the cemetery and its history. I feel that this story kind of encapsulates both the history of the Fort Custer military base as well as the Fort Custer National Cemetery in its entirety. Celia Pauline Towns grew up in Albion, Michigan, and when World War II broke out, she was in her 20s. She became active in the USO over here in Battle Creek and coordinated a lot of events through the Catholic Church, often being the, the woman who took care of refreshments at dances and USO gatherings. By 1945, she had become a nurse at Percy Jones Hospital and had just signed up for the U.S. Navy in February of that year. They were planning to recruit 
4,000 more nurses and send them overseas. Germany, of course, surrendered on May 7th, 1945. She met her future husband, Raymond John Signar, who was a staff sergeant at Percy Jones Hospital. He was also in the U.S. Army Band. Here he is in the photo. He's the man on the top upper left with the trumpet. They were married on May 19th, 1945 at Fort Custer Chapel, just a few weeks after Germany surrendered. What's interesting about this story is they are both buried side by side. After living out their full lives, they are interred here at Fort Custer National Cemetery, where their romance and marriage began as sort of a complete full circle of the history of Fort Custer. So that's gonna do it for today's tour of Fort Custer National Cemetery. I hope you learned a little bit about the history of the place. It is certainly very humbling to walk these grounds and see all of the amazing heroes that are buried here that helped forge our nation. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, please leave me a like, leave me a comment, tell me what you thought, and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you soon on my next video. Thanks for watching.